Okay, uh, you should be uh, able to see my screen, which has got a, a slide on it. Uh, on the right-hand side of the slide uh, is the cover of a book I published about a year ago, um, which is the basis, uh, at least largely, for the talk. Um, the book, Overdoing Democracies, I just finished the, uh, a follow-up, which should be out in about uh, seven or eight months with Oxford, called Sustaining Democracy. And... Um, I might have a few things to say uh, later in the talk uh, that are drawing um, explicitly from that second book. Um, so the talk is called uh, "Overdoing Democracy: The Problem of Poli uh, the Problem of Polarization," and um, one way to begin is to look on the left side of the screen because one of the theses of the book uh, and one of the um, theses underlying the talk uh, is there on the left pane. Um, the cure for democracy's ills is not more democracy, but less. Uh, I know that that sounds heretical and um, uh, or worse, uh, especially these days, especially from somebody these days uh, in the United States. How could the problem not be too, too little democracy? Um, so it's likely to strike you that um, that's a anti-democratic uh, thesis, uh, the part of the talk is try, is going to aim at trying to show you that it's not anti-democratic. The idea is that um, if we want to do democracy well, um, uh, we have to put politics in its place. Um, and so trying to make sense of that thought requires us to look at um, what's today's topic, which is polarization. Um, so here's, sorry, so here's the um, here's the outline. I want to start off by making um, uh, getting some clarity about what I could possibly mean when saying that there's too much democracy and we need to do less of it. Um, after that, we want to talk a little bit about what we're talking about when we're talking about democracy. Um, from there, I want to introduce the uh, phenomena of polarization. And in particular, I want to make a distinction between two different phenomena, political polarization and belief polarization, and talk about uh, how they interact together. Uh, the fourth part of the talk will be about um, how polarization in both of these senses work together to create um, conditions that are degenerative, I think, of our democratic capacities. Um, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about what can be done. All right. So um, first things first, uh, the name of the book is Overdoing Democracy, and it's about how it's possible uh, to have too much democracy. Um, we better get clear then first off about what we can, what we mean when we're talking about things that are good, but nonetheless could be overdone. Um, now, it's a familiar idea that it's possible to have too much of a good thing. And one very familiar way in which it's possible or respect in which it's possible to have too much of a good thing is what uh, philosophers and economists and others call diminishing utility. Um, cheesecake is a good example of a good that can be overdone on that model. Uh, as you're, I'm sure, aware, uh, no matter how satisfying the first bite of a cheesecake uh, is, um, by the eighth or ninth or tenth or fifteenth bite, uh, each um, subsequent bite starts getting uh, noticeably uh, uh, less satisfying, uh, and there's a point even at which um, the very idea of having another bite of cheesecake becomes uh, positively displeasing. And so one way in which a good thing can be overdone is on this model of diminishing utility. Now, of course, uh, the thesis uh, of the talk is not that democracies are like cheesecakes. So if there's a way in which you can overdo democracy, it must be the case that there's some other way to overdo a good thing. And I want to suggest that um, this concept that might be familiar to some of you from um, uh, applied ethics uh, and um, cognate areas, including um, economics, the idea of motivational crowding out or sometimes just crowding out uh, comes to us uh, largely from uh, debates about um, markets in human body parts. Um, but I think it gives us a um, interesting model for thinking about how you can have too much of a good thing that differs in important respects from the model of diminishing utility. That is, it's possible to overdo a good thing 
by way of crowding out. Um, and so when we overdo a good thing by way of crowding out, we overdo it in the following sense. We pursue the good thing in such a way or with such an intensity or to such a degree that its pursuit dispels or eliminates or expels from our lives other things of value. Um, you know, we have the idea um, in the popular vernacular of the workaholic, and that's one way in which, especially if you're somebody who really is a workaholic because you love your work, um, that's one sort of way to get start to get your head around this, the idea that, that you can pursue or devote yourself to a good thing to such in such a way that it eats away at uh, your ability, your capacity to pursue other things that are good. Now, I want to put one little spin on this and say that there's a way of overdoing a good thing by way of crowding out where we overdo a good thing by crowding out other goods when the and those other goods are part of the profile of the value of the overdone good. Let me give one quick example of this that we'll return to later. Think about physical fitness. And let's just stipulate, I don't think this is controversial, but let's just stipulate that being physically fit is good. And maybe being physically fit is intrinsically good. Maybe it's merely instrumentally good. I'm not um, taking a stand on the nature of these values. Um, you can have an intrinsic good and still say that it can be overdone. Um, but let's just say that physical fitness is a good. Now, imagine somebody who pursues physical fitness in such a way with such a single mindedness that um, it kind of takes over their life such that um, they don't have time or capacity to pursue anything but their next workout. Um, in fact, I had a friend uh, for whom this was the case. She pursued fitness in such a way that she lost touch with all of her friends. Um, now, she achieved, let's just stipulate, she achieved very impressive results from her fitness regimen. But everything in her life started to revolve around the single good thing, fitness. And now you might ask yourself, well, okay, that's a little strange, but so what? Um, I want to suggest, well, maybe it's, maybe it's more than just a little strange. There's something perhaps disorderly uh, about it, uh, disorderly from the perspective of the, the, uh, of the axiology, from the perspective of the values, in that one might say, well, look, Part of what the part of what being fit is good for is to enable one to pursue other good things. That is, a, the the point of being physically fit is not, and I would even say stronger, cannot be the next workout. That is, that the point of being fit is to enable the fit person to do things other than go to the gym, <laughs> and when. Going to the gym becomes the point and the next workout become the point of physical fitness. There's something deranged about the values. The person is no less physically fit for that and the fitness might be no less good for that. But there's something about the ordering of the values in this person's life that become, we might even say, pathological. In fact, in the case of we're really thinking about a person for whom physical fitness became a single-minded thing such that it was the one valuable pursuit of the person's life around which everything else orbited such that anything that couldn't be fit into its orbit was expelled. If we really were to imagine somebody fulfilling this description, I think it would, most of us would very quickly start reaching for diagnostic terms to describe the person's condition. We would start talking about obsession, compulsion. Um, we, would, um, uh, we would look for ways to diagnose what had happened rather than merely describe the person's condition as somebody who's involved in uh, the pursuit of a value that seems you know, strange to us. We would say, it seems strange, but it's strange in a way that is a symptom of something that stands in need of diagnosis. Okay, 
Um, so hold that thought that it's possible to overdo a good thing by way of, of crowding out. Now, if the claim is that we have too much democracy and need less, uh, I've just described something about what I might mean or what I do mean by too much or overdoing. Let's turn to democracy. Um, when we think about democracy, we naturally think of, especially uh, maybe particularly uh, in the United States over the last couple of weeks, uh, we think about elections and votes and campaigns and um, televised debates and uh, various other kinds of practices and mechanisms and institutions. Um, and, you know, democracy is all of that. It's not a mistake to think of democracy in those terms. Um, However, it's very difficult to make sense of why democracy has those particular practical and institutional manifestations unless we think of democracy in those practical and institutional manifestations as serving uh, a moral ideal. Uh, it's the moral ideal of self-government among political equals. That is, in a democracy, no one is, at least from the point of view of politics, no one is another subordinate or lackey or superior or boss. Now, one of the things that self-government among equals entails uh, is that um, there's going to be ongoing political disagreement in a democracy. And the reason why it entails it is because part of, you know, one of the aspects of or the one of the, the manifestations of our political equality is that no one politically is entitled to simply dictate to his or her fellow citizens what they must believe. That is part of what it is to be a member of a self-governing society of political equals is that you, along with your fellow citizens, uh, in, in your given your status as equals, we each get to make up our own minds about things, perhaps within some very broad constraints that we could talk about later. But within those constraints, we each get to think our own thoughts and to assess uh, uh, the evidence and the reasons and the considerations that go into building our political ideas. We get to we get to do that on our own. Now, what that means is that uh, among equals, there's going to be disagreement. Um, now. When we think about democracy, particularly when we think about democracy in terms of this moral ideal of self-government among political equals, we often very quickly turn specifically to thinking about the institutional implications of that ideal for how the government and its officials and its policies and laws have to regard those within its jurisdiction. That is, when we're thinking of democracy as the ideal of self-government among equals, we tend almost exclusively, I think too quickly, to focus on the relationship between government, government institutions, government policies, and the citizens who are thereby governed uh, uh, by those policies and institutions and, and the decisions of those officials. What, and, and democracy involves that, and there are lots of philosophical issues that uh, emerge there that um, I'm not saying are unimportant. However, if we are a community of self-governing equals, that is, if we are committed as Democrats to the idea of a self-governing community of equals, or to the idea that we are self-governing equals, then it also is the case that we owe one another a particular kind of regard. That is, it's not merely a matter that the government has to recognize our political equality, in instituting its policies and the rest, we owe to one another a due regard for one another's equality. Because after all, if the democratic ideal is the idea of government among equals, then we are one another's equals and not merely or not only equals in the eyes of the government. And that is to say that in conducting ourselves politically, within a democratic society. We owe one another a certain kind of consideration or regard. We might even say in some registers, respect. That is, we have to recognize or acknowledge one another as, an e as equals. And I wanna say that that means that democracy, for all of its institutional um, 
uh, policy-driven, office-driven facets also involves an ethic, an, a, an ethos that attaches to or applies to citizens, people acting in their role as self-governors. Um, and I want to just say, look, part of what we owe one another <laughs> Uh, in a democratic society. Part of what we owe to our fellow citizens in a democracy is to interact, even when we are conducting political disagreements, but to interact in a way that manifests or demonstrates that we recognize one another as equals. And I just want to call that general capacity, civic friendship, now, we can get into during Q&A a lot of, you know, the sort of details about uh, uh, civic friendship, but let's just, I'm just going to now just like just stipulate this as a term. By civic friendship, I mean that capacity, and it might have many little ingredients, that capacity to regard our fellow citizens as political equals, despite the fact that we must also see some of them as political opponents, and maybe we'll see some of them as political foes. That is, within a broad range, a broad spectrum of political opinion, we need to recognize our fellow citizens as our political equals, which means that we must recognize them not merely as fellow citizens who get an equal say in political decision making, but rather we owe it to one another to manifest in our dealings with one another the attitude that. We are each entitled to an equal say. You don't really get an equal say as a democratic citizen. You are entitled to one. Now, you know, when I put it that way, you can already see that civic friendship is not an easy uh, uh, set of capacities. It's not an easy disposition or attitude. It's difficult, particularly because when we're talking about democracy, most of the time we see our political opponents as not merely mistaken about some particular policy question that we might be confronting. We see them as mistaken in a way that puts them in the wrong, maybe even puts them on the side of injustice from our point of view with respect to the question that we're asking. And so democracy in part is the moral requirement for each of us to regard our political opponents as nonetheless our political equals, therefore entitled to an equal say, even though we are bound to see at least some of them as advocating injustice. Now, there's a deep, difficult, paradoxical thought that uh, you're familiar with, democratic theorists have been working on for a long time about whether that kind of attitude is uh, possible and uh, possible to sustain. Uh, but that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about democracy. Okay, so. Now, we've got two thoughts. One is the overdoing by way of crowding out thought. The other is democracy involves this ethics of citizenship thought, what I'm calling civic friendship. Okay, now here's where things I think get, um, get philosophically uh, uh, um, uh, problematic. Now in the States in particular, I suspect this is probably true also in the UK, uh, there's a lot of talk about something called polarization. Uh, and in fact, um, you'll hear it now from our president-elect, who sometimes uses the word polarization, sometimes just uses the word, you know, toxic divisiveness, so on and so forth. Um, now, although the word is part of the vernacular of popular political commentary, particularly in the states, um, it's not often um, clarified. It's not often we're not we don't use the word, in, at least in, in the idiom, in any way that's uh, regimented or clear or precise. So I want to make a distinction now between two different, though I think interacting, but two different phenomena, both of which are properly called polarization. Now, the first is represented, I think, is familiar, and I think is represented fairly clearly on the, on the slide. So political polarization is the metric of the, we might call doctrinal or ideological distance between two political units. And in the United States, it's very natural to say it's the distance between the two major parties. And what goes on in political polarization is the two major parties sort of more fully huddle together, 
closer to the poles of their ideological commitments, which causes the middle ground or the common ground between them to drop out. And so each of the parties becomes more ideologically aligned with one another. The people who are the bridge builders fall away and, and accordingly the common ground falls away and political polarization leads to a lot of frustration and resentment and political uh, inefficiency. Uh, it's uh, what's behind a lot of log jams and um, other kinds of governmental dysfunctions because if the middle ground actually falls out in a democracy, it's hard to see how anything could get done. Now, there are different ways of understanding how to measure the distance, or what I've called the ideological or doctrinal distance between political groups. Um, and we could talk about the different ways. And uh, you know, when you're looking at any particular society, when somebody asks, is that society heavily politically polarized? It matters what kind of you know, which metric you're you're thinking of, um, and we can get into that uh, a little bit later if you like. Um, but leaving that to the side, that's familiar. Um, there's this other phenomenon also called polarization, called belief polarization. Sometimes in the literature, this is called group polarization. I think group, the term group in this context is a little misleading because both uh, versions of polarization are about groups. Anyway, belief polarization is not a metric of the ideological distance between political opponents, although it's related to that. Belief polarization is a cognitive phenomenon that occurs within like-minded groups, that occurs to members of like-minded groups. It is a measure of a shift between an individual's commitments before they start interacting with like-minded others and their commitments with respect to those same issues after they interact with like-minded others. So belief polarization is a uh, cognitive regularity um, that says interaction with like-minded others turns us into more extreme versions of ourselves. Now, um, for the epistemologists in the room, there are lots of interesting questions that can be asked about what we mean by extreme here. Are we talking about belief contents? Are we talking about degrees of belief? Are we talking about some third thing like um, fervency or, or, or commitment to one's epistemic standpoint? Uh, and we can talk about the particular um, uh, experiments. Uh, and I think that there's a little bit of all of that going on, uh, at least when the, the phenomenon is pronounced. Um, but uh, belief polarization is um, widely studied. We've been studying this since the 1950s. It's been studied all around the world. Belief polarization um, is found in groups of all kinds. It doesn't vary with any of the demographic features that you think it might. Uh, belief polarization doesn't vary significantly with race, age, gender, religious identification, occupation, level of education, economic status, so on and so forth. Um, it applies and can be found and even can be, in, uh, can be induced um, in different kinds of discussion contexts. That is, groups of like-minded people believe polarize when the point of their interaction is to produce a collective decision, um, some, make a collective plan. Groups also polarize when the point of their interaction is not to make a collective decision at all, it's just to share perspectives. Um, uh, belief, a group's belief polarize when there's no particular point to their interaction as well, when they're just sitting around talking uh, about the thing uh, with respect to which they're like-minded. Moreover, Belief polarization doesn't respect the difference that we're familiar with uh, between uh, sort of facts and values. Um, groups that are like-minded with respect to certain kinds of evaluative judgments, the comfort, the comfortableness of a given chair, uh, the attractiveness of a given face, uh, the severity uh, of a particular kind of crime, um, so on and so forth. Groups belief polarize when they are united around a particular value judgment but they also believe polarize and they believe polarize in a way that's not significantly different um, in degree or distance 
when they're unified around a purely factual belief, like the elevation of the city of Denver, Colorado, you get a bunch of people who think Denver is notably high above sea level for a city in the United States. And the more they talk, the higher they think Denver is, which is not an evaluative judgment. It's a matter just of pure fact. Um, if you're familiar with um, sort of uh, popular concerns about echo chambers and uh, information bubbles that people, uh, you know, the kinds of concerns that people raise about online spaces, um, you're probably sort of familiar, at least you're familiar with at least part of what's being described here as belief polarization. Uh, many of those concerns are driven by, sometimes tacitly driven by, a concern with the idea that uh, when you're trapped inside an echo chamber, when you listen only to louder and louder echoes of your own voice, when you're in your own little information or epistemic bubble, it's bad for you cognitively because you become more radicalized. Um, belief polarization is uh, a longstanding um, finding in social psychology that shows, yeah, well, that intuitive understanding of what yes men and groupthink are all about. Well, this is a pretty robust uh, social scientific finding. Um, I want to add one other thing about belief polarization before moving on, which is that um, groups that contain, like-minded groups that contain one or two extremist members shift no more quickly or no more drastically than like-minded groups that are composed all of moderates. That is, the phenomenon is not driven by the one extremist loudmouth in the group browbeating and pulling everyone closer to his view. Even in a group of people who all are moderates, the shift occurs no less, occurs no less quickly and no less drastically. Um, there are questions that one could ask, which we can get into in the Q&A, about what the mechanism of all this is. And I've got views about that. Um, but anyhow, um, often when we're thinking about belief polarization, especially among philosophers, um, a lot of the literature is about the sort of what we might think of as sort of the natural concerns for epistemologists. It looks as if belief polarization and its robustness suggest all kinds of things about our degree of doxastic control, uh, how um, responsive we are given the, the sort of uh, realistic constraints uh, that our cognitive system places on us, like how responsive are we to evidence really, uh, so on and so forth. What's often given short shrift is the fact that as we shift into our more extreme selves, not only do our commitments become more extreme in various ways, our views about others, our views about the people with whom we are not like-minded also shift. That is to say, as we shift into our more extreme selves, we come to embrace increasingly negative attitudes and assessments of those who we perceive to be different. They don't even have to actually be different. They don't even have to actually reveal themselves to be politically not like-minded or not like-minded about the, the thing with respect to which uh, uh, we're talking uh, about belief polarization. They just have to seem to us to be different in a relevant respect. And to the extent that we see them as different in the relevant respect, as we belief polarize, as we shift into our more extreme selves, they uh, look to us like they're the ones shifting into their more extreme selves. Kind of works like the side mirror on a car, sort of things look further away uh, uh, than they in fact are. So as we shift into our more extreme selves, our, our opponents, the people with whom we disagree, um, look to us more disfigured, distorted, um, we become um, more likely to interrupt them when they're speaking in group uh, discussion contexts. Um, we become less able to hear the things they say as reasons. They look more alien. They look more inscrutable to us. And moreover, we come to attribute to them as we shift to our more extreme selves. We come to ascribe to our opponents negative intellectual and moral traits 
We come to see them as unpatriotic, untrustworthy, dishonest, irrational. And in extreme cases, we even come to see them as something like diseased or disgusting. Um, now, um, note the point here very clearly. Belief polarization counteracts, undermines, erodes, whatever you think the, the particulars are of the capacities for civic friendship. That is, as we believe polarized, we become less able to see those with whom we disagree as deserving or entitled to an equal political say because they look to us increasingly depraved, divested, immoral, uh, and worse. Okay, um, so we might even put it that belief polarization encourages uh, uh, and intensifies the opposite of civic friendship, civic enmity. Good. Now, this might be a familiar story thus far. Again, if you've been following any of the popular discussions about the dangers of online uh, spaces and social media spaces and the capacity of uh, uh, epistemic bubbles and uh, echo chambers to extremify people. Um, so you might be familiar with all of what's been said so far from discourses about online and social media spaces. And I will say that those are real concerns and I don't mean to, um, uh, to downplay them. However, here's the real troubling fact. Whatever you think is true about the dangers from the point of view of extremification about online spaces, in the States, this is particularly pronounced, but it's not unique to the States, but a lot of the examples I'm about to give you are uh, drawn from the US where it's particularly pronounced, our social spaces as such, both online and off, have become increasingly segregated according to partisan and political identification. Let me put it slightly differently. In the United States in particular, as the society has become more diverse, in the aggregate, the local spaces individual citizens inhabit and move around in, in their day-to-day -day lives, have become increasingly politically homogeneous. So as we get increasing, very uh, uh, promising and positive diversity in the aggregate, the little slice of the social world that individuals inhabit has become more and more homogeneous, less diverse. And at the same time, our individual social spaces, the, the, the physical and social environments that we inhabit in our day-to-day -day lives, not only have become more homogeneous, they've become more homogeneous in a way that's fixed more intensely on partisan identity. That is in the United States and elsewhere, the local spaces people inhabit in their day-to-day -day lives have become more fully organized around their political identities, even more so than their religious identities, than their economic class, than any other sort of marker of the ways in which societies sort of naturally sort themselves into different kinds of social spaces. Partisan identity has become increasingly central to all of that. What this means is that Everyday activities, from where you buy your groceries, how you get to work, what you do on the weekends, what television shows you watch, our everyday activities are, have become increasingly segregated into, in the States, liberal and conservative, such that ordinary unplanned social interactions with strangers have become in, more and more intensely likely to put individuals in touch only with people who share their political identity. That is, as our spaces have become segregated along partisan lines, naturally, the chances of interacting unexpectedly with somebody who doesn't share one's partisan identity have diminished. The world around us, we might say, has become an echo chamber. And let me just run through some of these examples really, really quickly on the, so what, what this means is that not only 
do things like your consumer choices, you know, where you where you buy your groceries in the states, what kinds of groceries you buy, do you shop organic, you know, how much kale is in your uh, refrigerator, uh, you know, your what you do on the weekend, where you vacation. Uh, certainly in the states, we know that this is a problem. You know, where you get your news. Um, the time you spend in the closest park to your home positively correlates with uh, how liberal your politics are. Online dating, uh, this is not only in the United States, by the way, this is a pretty robust finding across the world. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, most reliable indi the most reliable indicator of success in online matchmaking is co-partisanship. In fact, in the United States, this might be surprising to you, um, Disapproving attitudes of interpartisan marriage now outstrip disapproving attitudes about interracial and interfaith marriages. Uh, I'm going to skip hot sauce, hot sauce preferences and let somebody ask me about it later. Um, the number of clocks in your home positively correlates with how conservative you are. The number of maps in your home positively correlates with how liberal you are. And there's a whole thing about tote bags I can get into. But here's the point the point is that as these social spaces have become more and more segregated along partisan lines. As our political identities have become more and more central to the organization of our everyday lives, acting in those spaces, behaving as expected in those spaces has also become a way of expressing and communicating to others one's partisan identity, such that in the States, Driving a large pickup truck is now not only highly correlated with being a conservative politically, it is also a way of expressing to the world that you are a conservative. Similarly, in the United States, driving a hybrid car or even just a small economy car is also a way not only of living your liberal values, but also of communicating to others what your values are. And in fact, those kinds of uh, trends in sort of you know, big, big consumer choices, those kinds of trends are robust across economic differences. That is, you take a liberal and a conservative that are economically similarly placed, and the liberal will have more in common in his consumer choices with his fellow liberals, including the ones who are economically much differently placed than he will with the conservative who's far more like him economically. Now in a big territory like the United States, we can even say the following. Liberals who live in Vermont in common in their everyday lifestyles uh, uh, with liberals in LA than the liberals in Vermont have with conservatives in Vermont. And that's a robust uh, 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 trend across the United States that geographical differences in lifestyle choices, in consumer choices, even in values, uh, like values with respect to child rearing, for example, are robust across partisan identity in ways that defy or don't, or just don't track, we might even say, geographical differences. The liberals in New York raised their children and have families that are similar and more similar to families in California that are liberal than those families are to conservatives that are in New York. Okay, um, I could say something about tote bags, but I'm not going to. Now, what does all this mean? Well, this shows us that the polarization stuff really works in a dynamic. We might even say a loop. Belief polarization begets civic enmity. We've already seen that part of the profile of belief polarization is to prime, prompt, and then escalate negative affect, negative estimations, negative images of those who we perceive to be politically different. That in turn creates more polarization because after all, in ways that are entirely natural, predictable, expected, and I don't even think blameworthy, <laughs> right? When you see certain kinds of people as untrustworthy, as um, alien, as inscrutable, you don't spend time with them. You don't, you, you look to avoid them, in fact. That creates the social conditions under which your everyday goings about in the world 
put you in touch with only people who are more or less just like yourself. And when partisan identity becomes increasingly central and becomes the center of our social understandings of who we are, what this means is that we set ourselves up, we expose ourselves, we immerse ourselves in physical environments that induce more and more polarization, belief polarization. Let me say one thing about that that's not on the slide. Note, a heavily belief polarized citizenry is great news for politicians, political strategists, and campaign managers. When you can count on your base as having a lot in common with one another, and when you can count on your base as having heavily intensified negative affect and estimations towards anyone they perceive to be different, those send really strong strategic cues to the people who are running for office, to the people who are in office, to the people who are managing candidates. Namely, emphasize differences, articulate contempt for the other side, valorize intransigence. Oh, by the way, sounds like the United States. That is, in a heavily belief polarized society, you should expect high levels of political polarization, however we understand that term. Whatever we understand the, the metric is of the ideological distance between liberals and conservatives in the United States case, we should expect a lot of that in a heavily belief polarized society because it's strategically smart to, be, to emphasize political polarization because as we know, especially in the States, uh, winning elections is not a matter of changing hearts and minds. Winning elections is a matter of turnout and nothing really uh, matches contempt for motivating political behavior, especially in the United States. Uh, uh, nothing really matches contempt. Okay, good. Um, so there's the dynamic. Let's put the pieces. So we've said crowding out is a way of overdoing a good thing. We said that democracy involves this ideal of civic friendship, the, the, the capacity to recognize your political opponents as nonetheless your equals, therefore entitled to an equal say. Belief polarization undermines and dissolves those capacities because it leads us to see our political opponents as deformed and benighted and um, uh, contemptible. Um, and then we said, well, that encourages segregation along partisan lines in, so, in the social world, and that segregation uh, uh, produces uh, um, uh, the infiltration of our political identities into everything we do, which in turn produces more belief polarization. That's where and how we overdo democracy in the following sense. Um, all of our social interactions become organized by or conditioned by our political identities that crowds out all the other bases for um, uh, social cooperation, that crowds out the other uh, uh, um, kinds of activities on the basis of which we might come to see another human being as a decent individual. Um, and so we start seeing the convergence of our conception of proper citizenship with our conception of our co-partisans, such that, especially this is pronounced in the United States, we come to more and more see those who don't share our partisan identity as incapable of democratic citizenship. So what can we do? Now note, Nothing in the diagnostic stuff I've just been talking about has ascribed or attributed to any actor bad political behavior. In fact, I want to say, getting together with like-minded others, working together with people who are like yourself in order to figure out how you're going to achieve your political ends, building coalitions of like-minded people. Um, indeed, you might even say uh, manifesting um, a certain degree, at least, of negative affect and attitude and belief about your political opponents is just inexorable from democracy. That's just part of what democracies are. And in fact, it seems to me that many of these activities that I just described are sort of um, 
uh, constituents of good citizenship. That's what I mean when I said at the beginning, the problem, <laughs> the problem for th this particular problem can't be solved with more democracy. This is a problem that emerges out of democracy itself. In fact, it's a problem that emerges out of people, em emerges out of a condition where citizens are doing pretty much what they should be doing as citizens. So here's the, the, the solution then. If we want to treat one another as our political equals, if we want to enact the office of, demo of democratic citizenship properly and well, we need to find a way to see others as something other than partisan allies or opponents. We need to see others as something beyond their political affiliation. For democracy to thrive, we need to see one another as more than citizens, as something beyond being our fellow citizens. The trouble isn't that some anti-democratic norms have sort of spoiled uh, uh, the democracy. What's spoiling the democracy is the overdoing of our democratic identities. Our sincere efforts to perform well as democratic citizens have served to undo the whole thing. The answer then is what I call desaturation. We need to find things to do together in which politics has no place. That's not a call for more activities where you reach across the aisle or you invite your Republican friends over for lunch or you learn to love your political enemies or you, um, you, know, you admit to yourself that maybe the liberals have a point. None of that is what's being proposed. Everything I just mentioned keeps politics at the center of the endeavor. The thought rather is that if we are to perform well as democratic citizens, we have to sometimes do something in which our political differences are not suppressed, but instead are simply beside the point. We need to find things to do together in which we're not suppressing our political differences or bracketing our political differences. We need, co we need to find cooperative endeavors to engage in together where we are simply unaware of what the other participants' political leanings are because the endeavor that we are engaged in together has nothing to do with politics. Now, I know, I've given this, given this talk often enough, to predict what some faces in the, in the audience are now doing, sort of struggling to think about what, what possibly could be a non-political cooperative endeavor. And I wanna to suggest to you that insofar as the idea of a non-political cooperative endeavor strains your imagination, that's a symptom of the polarization dynamic, not the beginning of a counterexample to the analysis. And if you wanna get your head around that, let's just ask ourselves the, uh, ourselves the question, what's democracy for? Now, I think that it's possible to talk about what democracy is for, or the good that is the point of democracy in a way that doesn't prejudice the question of whether it's intrinsically or not intrinsically value or merely instrumentally valuable. Not asking about the nature of its value here. I think that no matter what you think the nature of democracy's value is, you can still say and still think it's part of the profile of that value to talk about what it's good for. Well, what is democracy good for? Well, what makes democracy, it seems to me, so important and so precious is that it promises to us a stable, decent, relatively just social order in which individuals can devote themselves at least part of the time to the pursuit of valuable things other than politics. That is, part of what de makes democracy the kind of good that it is, is that it makes available to us valuable lives in which Politics doesn't really play a major or leading role. Lives devoted to collective projects involving love and care and nurturing support, creativity, in which politics is just not part of the profile of what's being done. We lose sight of what democracy is for. And in fact, we crowd out those other kinds of goods that are essential to democracy's flourishing when we adopt the idea that everything is politics. 
when we adopt the idea that everything is politics, not only because of the polarization dynamic, do we become less good and less competent as democratic citizens, we also lose sight of the point of the entire endeavor, which is, to, again, to make available to people lives that are devoted to goods outside of politics. And so as paradoxical as it might sound, if democracy is to flourish, if we are, I'm sorry, if we are to perform well as democratic citizens, we sometimes need to do things together in which politics is out of place. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Bob. Uh, that was fascinating. Uh, I'm sure it'll be provocative uh, for, for our audience. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to end the recording.